Okay. okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to our Wednesday webinar again. Uh, we are now having a talk with uh, Dr. Putra, who's actually my colleague from Beacon. He is a full time there now. Previously, he was a professor in where was it? Uh, UPM. Uh? Where were no, you? No, actually, I was in Sungai Bulo Hospital. Oh, you were in Sungai Bulo. I thought you were in teaching yes. hospital. Oh. I think you're confusing me with one of our other colleagues. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> so now he's full time there uh, in Beacon. How long have you been full time in Beacon now? I think coming up to one and a half years, I think. Oh, that's fast, huh? And I tell you, the amazing thing is he just operated on this 90 over year old gentleman. Uh, for, I was like, oh my God. And then one day is out of ICU already, that guy. Amazing. This we have a we have an excellent geriatrician. I think that's that's the key. <laughs> Okay, so um, so with the, 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 of well. course, Mitra has given us a talk before, and uh, it was really well received. And then today we're going to talk about the loose knee. Let's go ahead without further ado. Come. Okay, so I'll share my slides. Okay. All right, there we are. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um. I, I, I hope that all of you can you know, ask some questions when, when you have something to ask. And it's a Wednesday evening, it's a very rainy. I hope we won't, we won't go into, we won't really go into like extreme details. We're just gonna keep it light and sweet last today. So I want to tell you a story of one of my patients. So there's this lady, she's uh, in her mid thirties and she just took up ballet not that long ago. Now, the unique thing is because most people take up ballet, I'm told, at the age of six years old or somewhere around there. So she started learning ballet at the age of 35. And she came to me saying that she has, uh, she feels that she's got pain. A few weeks after starting ballet, she's got pain in her knee. And she feels like, you know, when she dances, that she's going to suddenly fall because her knee suddenly just wobbles and, and feels very loose. And so I, I did an ultrasound scan. I did an x-ray for her knee. Everything was quite normal. We had a look at all the muscles and tendons and everything. And I told her, okay, look, I mean, I can't find anything wrong with you. Uh, maybe what you can do is just take a short break, do some exercises to strengthen your muscles. So she was not very happy with me. And she went and asked the ballet teacher, now, you know, what, what, what is the reason that I'm having this? And I tell you this because I learn new things every day. And I think we really have to keep ourselves open to be able to learn things from everyone. So what her ballet teacher told her is that, uh, you know, look, most people who, who learn ballet learn this at a very young age and you are starting so late in life, relatively late. And uh, because of this, your muscles are not used to the motions that uh, you go through in ballet. And so just give it a while. Your muscles will train themselves. You have to focus on using the right muscles to do the right things. And after a few weeks, when I saw her again, then she's like, you know, my, my knee feels much better now. So I think that we can learn lots of things from you know, experts in their fields, like even ballet dancers and, and uh, physiotherapists, trainers. So I think that's really something important in my field. But let's go to the, the topic at hand. So can you to make it you know, more- Can you put on slide, Sorry? please? Can you put on slide? Ah, okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Is that better? All right. Yeah. Okay. You know, as, as medical people, we probably want to, to use the correct term. So the loose knee is a very vague term. What we really mean is knee instability. Now, for those who don't see patients with knee instability all the time, I think it's rather hard to imagine what an unstable knee actually is. I mean, if you tell me that you have pain in the knee, it's quite easy to imagine. But if you say weakness, it's, it's very easy. But if you say unstable, what it really means is that when you're doing some normal activity like running, like changing directions when you walk fast, you suddenly feel that your knee is not up to, to taking the, the normal load that it should. You can't trust your knee, in other words. So I'd like to try to make you, you know, imagine what it's like if you have not felt it before. So imagine you are running and suddenly there's an earthquake. So the ground is moving and, you know, everything is just not what it's what you imagine it to be. So you try to put your leg somewhere, but the ground moves. And so you, you can't really get your bearings. And that's roughly what it feels like to have an unstable knee. Another 
way you can think about it is, you know, imagine you're running on a beach and there's lots of fluffy white sand. And when you put your legs there, the sand just sinks in. So you, you can't really assess how your, your stability is. That's what it's like. One last example, imagine you go climbing up a mountain. And Betty, I think you probably would have lots of... Oh, this is like uh, like Rinjani. Yes. Sorry? This is like Rinjani. Rinjani, you Rinjani, okay. two steps, you, it comes down one step. Uh, yeah, because, uh -huh. yeah, because it's loose. Okay. Yeah. So I think you, you perfectly understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. Instability. So yeah, I mean, what it, what it is is that it, you, can't, you feel like you can't trust your knee. You feel like your knee is going to give way anytime. You feel like you might just fall because your knee buckles and just, you know, just folds on itself. So when we uh, talk about instability of the knee, I'm trying to go to the next slide. Okay, we, we have to think about, you know, what could cause this. And I'd like to divide it into four main groups. So you can see some of the pictures here. The first thing is muscle weakness around the knee. And very often that happens because of maybe a prior injury and you have not been using your knee much. Or it might happen because of a neurological issue. You know, that, that's something that we have to think about as well. So weakness of the muscles is one thing. Another common thing, you see the lady at the bottom of the screen, she's like totally flexible. She's like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. can bend all her joints all into very uh, bizarre shapes. Now, some people have something which we call generalized hypermobility. It's not something abnormal per se. It is a variant of being normal. It's just that perhaps uh, they have, you know, extra collagen fibers in their in their ligaments, and so their ligaments are a little bit on the loose side, and and this can result in instability of the knee. The third thing you see, there's a little girl crying in the middle with her, her knee. There's a plaster there. It's in pain. So when you have pain uh, in the knee, what happens is your, your knee tries to protect you. So when you have when you've got pain, it doesn't want to feel pain, doesn't want you to feel pain. So it automatically shuts off certain muscles. And as a result, you suddenly feel that your knee is unstable. However, I think today, the thing that we want to focus on, or I think is, is more re relevant to our talk today, is when we talk about acute or traumatic injuries uh, to ligaments in the knee. And uh, we, we call this basically traumatic instability. So we will look at some of these, but I'll focus more on traumatic instabilities, probably because I know more about that. But we, we, we will cover some of the others as well. So if you look at these pictures, you see that, you know, these two people, one of their legs looks much bigger than the other. The other one looks like broken. Now, this is very common, especially if you've had a, a fracture or, you know, some sort of injury around that, uh, that leg and you, you reduce the, the usage of that leg, so it, the muscles atrophy. As a result, when you, you get back into uh, normal movement, very often the patient feels that their knee is unstable. Of course, in this case, as long as there's no neurological issue, the treatment is pretty straightforward. What we do is muscle strengthening, and these are some of the exercises that I commonly teach my patients I put it on my website, www.drputra.com. So if any of you want to you know, use it for your patients, feel free, you can just take it. You don't have to, to you know, uh, give credit to me or anything. You just print it out and, and show it to your patients. Uh, cycling is a very good way to, to build up the quadriceps muscle, especially. And I'd like to, to also uh, say that we, I really have to work closely with physiotherapists because um, physiotherapists are really good because they, are, they can actually supervise the patients and they can do other things as well. Like for example, this is electrical muscle stimulation and uh, it's a good way not just to, to build up the muscle, but rather to, to reactivate muscle that has deactivated because of, whether it's because of surgery, injury, etc. So this is the example of a referral to the physio. I mean, it sounds quite simple that the physios just, you know, do exercises, but we have to really think about a plan for this patient, what are our goals, what we want to achieve within certain time. And so this is just an example, example of how uh, important the physiotherapist is to rehabilitating patients with knee instability. Now, we talked about patients with generalized hypermobility. Now, on the, the upper left part of the slide, you see something which we call the Basin score. What this is, is we put uh, patients who we suspect that are uh, hypermobile series of tests, and you can use this on your patients as well. And we determine based on this scoring system are they hyperlax or are they not?
if they are hyperlaxed, what it means, you can see like the dancer on the right, uh, her knee is fully hyperextended. So people in this situation, they are, number one, they will feel some instability is normal. Uh, number two is they are more prone to injury. So they have to take extra precaution, things like warming up well before going for their sports, uh, things like learning proper technique with a sport. Like I told you that my, my patient, she, she asked her ballet teacher how to avoid this. And actually these trainers, a good trainer is very important to the sport. And I think that's really something that we really have to, to focus on, not to just launch into a sport without getting any proper guidance. I think that's really important, even more so if uh, your patient has hypermobility. Putra, uh, uh, when it comes to hyper, yeah. Sorry, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about hypermobility? For example, the lady mm -hmm. who do the split or the dancer, do mm -hmm. you still consider them hypermobility because it's actually by, you know, training and practice? Like for us, on the general term, hypermobility seems to be like where they have a uh, collagen or I mean, some form of disease or genetic disorder, no? You mean like uh, Marfan syndrome and, yeah, right. and loss and things like yeah. that, right? Well, I mean, I would say that um, I'm not an expert at Marfan syndrome and Ehlers mm -hmm. loss, but I would say that uh, even in the, the patients that don't fall into those groups, many, many of the patients who come to see me for lax joints, even those that come for ankle sprains, for example, if you actually test them, you'll find that a large percentage of them are hypermobile. That's why I said it's not, it's not an abnormality. It's just something that I, when I test, the reason I test is I want to determine is this patient at risk of getting another injury or not. I see. Now, as, okay. long as, they have, yeah, as long as they have not had any other symptoms, they don't have you know, the classical eye issues, heart issues, and things like that, I, I wouldn't necessarily work, I mean, worry about those syndromes. Okay. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, okay. All right. But the, the important thing is uh, when, when you see the patient with knee instability and they are generally hyperlax, you do have to focus on the other joints as well. Very often they have shoulder instability, so it's important to not just rehabilitate their knee, but also they could easily get shoulder dislocations. So it's important to strengthen the muscles around the shoulder too. Um, other than hypermobility, leaving that aside, we go to pain as a cause of instability. Now, as I mentioned, if you've got pain around the knee, your knee is trying to protect you by shutting off certain muscles so that you don't do something funny that's going to injure it more. But as a result, you, you feel it as an instability. Now, there, as you can see, the anatomy of the knee is quite complex. We are not going to go through the entire anatomy of the knee right now, but I think it's really important to try to visualize what's there inside the knee. For example, when you examine a patient that has a, a, knee, a pain, they say, I have a pain in the knee. So you really have to determine where it is. It, it really is helpful if you're able to imagine what's under the skin. And maybe this drawing will help you to, to mm. kind of visualize that. Because you, when you're palpating, you know, sometimes you just say, okay, tender over this area. But actually, you, you need to really visualize that when you, when, you, when you make a diagnosis, it's easier to, to go forward with the treatment. We can communicate better with the radiologist, with the physiotherapist, and things like that. Now, I want to point out a few common things that can be painful. So there are things that we call bursa, uh, which are basically they are just little bubbles under the skin or between the muscles that help the soft tissues to move better. Usually, there's no fluid in them, but sometimes when they get inflamed, you can get uh, fluid and even infection in the bursa. Uh, if you are in a primary care setting, don't be uh, you know, scared to put a needle there and remove the fluid if you if you have to, if it's too painful. But just remember that these bursa exist and they can cause pain and they're easily treatable because you can treat it with things like NSAIDs to reduce inflammation. You can put a needle there and remove the fluid. So it's something to remember. And other than that, of course, the, the slightly more uh, well-known things will be meniscus injuries. Uh, I hope that's not too gory, uh, Betty, that, that is a picture that I don't think mm. it is. Why is it? So, yeah, I hope that picture is not too gory and Facebook won't. Oh, no, 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 uh, no. The gory, you no, have just. Okay. You, the, the, right. the gory, no we have there. gory, yes. Okay. It was gory. Okay. <laughs> so, so, that's what the meniscus tear looks like. And uh, that could cause uh, instability 
it could even cause something which we which we term locking of the knee. We'll talk about that a bit later. Okay. And this is cartilage injury. Maybe this is a bit more. What happens is an injury. You're breaking up. Are you break? Is it my mine or yours? Huh? Can you? Your 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 speech huh, is uh, breaking up. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you now. But yours is like uh, stuttering. Okay, you try and see. One moment. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, better, much better. Can, can you hear me? Yes, good. Hello? Yeah? Hmm. You can hear me? Let me... Okay, you... No, I can't hear you now. I can't hear you at all. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. How come I can't hear you suddenly? Hold on now. Huh? Let me see. Yeah, you're not on mute. Suddenly I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Izo? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Only... uh. Oh, right, Putra. Hey, what happened to him, Doctor Putra? Putra, come back. Doctor Putra, oh, I think okay, he... okay, now we can hear you finally. Okay, come, we continue. Where is he? Putra. Okay. I think my microphone is working. Can you hear me? Yeah, no, okay. Yeah, you okay. can. Sorry. I think there's some issue with my with my connection here. Okay. Okay. All right. We're back on. Yeah, that's right. So you want to All play right. something for us, right? Yes. I, I just wanted to show you this uh, this picture. So we're talking about pain as a cause of instability. I think I'll just go through this since we have lost a bit of time. Cartilage injuries can cause pain, so I won't talk too much about. No, about don't this, worry. Just, right? just, yeah, just go through what you need to go through. It's quite Is interesting. It? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let me let me just restart this part. I just tell yeah. you that cartilage injuries basically happen because of an impact on the articular surface, which, as you know, is a smooth cartilage is very smooth, but sometimes it becomes rough, like on the picture on the left. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we drill little holes into the, the, the bone. And we, you can see there's a little, like it looks like a white piece on, on the lower corner of the screen, right? So what that is, is it's a, collagen, it's a collagen scaffold that we put in to fill up the defect in the, in the cartilage. And on the right most, what it is, is after several months when healing has already occurred. Oh. Okay. Oh, yeah. So the reason why I bring this up is because cartilage injuries, meniscus injuries, bursitis, all of these can cause pain that the patient feels as instability because the, the knees give way when they walk. How do you differentiate okay. this? Hmm. Sorry? How do you differentiate all these causes then? Will you tell us later? Okay. Yes, I will tell you. But let me I just tell you a brief Thing. Remember when I told you that you've got to imagine uh, the skin when you're palpating yes, the knee. Uh, yes. So that, that's part of it. That's uh -huh. part of it. But of course, nowadays, we tend to have things like MRI scanners and things like that that can tell you very accurately what goes okay. on. And if, if that fails, you can put a camera in the knee and have a look. You know, just like the general oh, surgeon puts a... Put, yes, correct. Just like okay. the general surgeon puts a... Uh, esophageal scope into the stomach and has a look for ulcers. So the same same concept. Okay. All right. Now the the last thing that the last reason of instability. What I want to tell you about is uh, acute pairs of the ligament. Now ligaments essentially, if you look at like this model here, right? So ligaments are things that they're little soft tissue structures that hold the bones together, 
And because of the ligaments, you actually have a stable knee. So if you've got a tear of the ligament, the knee becomes rather unstable, as you can see. It's, it's kind of I see. Okay, okay. Like that. Oh, that's a very good uh, model. Well, I mean, that's partly the reason why I, I stayed back here, but <laughs> to show you this model. Yeah, it's a very good model. I, immediately, anyone, even the lay people can see it. Yes. But there is also ligament inside. Are they less likely to yes. tear? Okay, they actually, okay. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about this. Yeah. Essentially, you've got two ligaments on the outer side of the okay. knee, and you've got two which are inside. So it's a bit difficult to see unless I pull yeah. everything away. So you see there's a ligament in here and at the back. Now, the difference between them is that the outer ligaments tend to heal better on their own, but the inner ones, because they are within the joint, they are floating around within the synovial fluid, so they don't really heal as well. So that's the difference between the two on the outside I and see. the two inside. We, we will go into a bit okay. more detail okay. later, but uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to start with ligament injuries now. Okay, now what I want you to remember is this palm tree, okay? I'm not saying that Penang drivers are not good, but uh, you may have seen Penang this drivers joke are around on, good. on social media. <laughs> anyway, not the, good. The, thing to the thing to focus on is the palm tree, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. Because the way that I, I like to tell people to remember these ligaments is with this uh, acronym called PALM, P-A-L-M. Okay. And uh, so you've got two cruciate ligaments, to the posterior cruciate and okay. the anterior cruciate, which is deep inside. So that's P and A. Then you've got your collateral ligaments, which are on the outer side. So there's the L, the lateral collateral, and M, the medial collateral. So these are the four main ligaments, the, the most famous ligaments in the knee. Oh, I see. So P is other... the posterior, anterior, mm -hmm. and then lateral, lateral and medial. Okay. Medium, yes. Okay. okay. So, I mean, you can take a screenshot if you want to remember it for later. Yeah. But uh, they are, those are the most famous ligaments. I think almost, uh, almost, I think if you take up a medical student, most of them should know about that, those four ligaments. But they are also more obscure ligaments which we can uh, injure. For example, the, the MPFL or medial patero-femoral ligament. It's so obscure that it's not even there on the model, so don't worry too much about it. Okay. But it can cause issues, okay? okay? And then there's the PLT, which is also absent from the model. And there's a new ligament which has just been discovered within the last 10 years or so. I mean, I know it's, it's quite bizarre. How can you discover a ligament after Yeah, this? exactly. Come but, on. No, actually, we've been doing, it's not that. We've been doing autopsy. We have been doing forensic cutting patient. And then we just discover a new ligament. It's not like a I new species, it's, it's, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not a new star or anything. But uh, okay, what what do what what do we mean by new? What what is the ligament? We have to ask ourselves. Okay. A ligament is simply a, a thickening of the capsule. For example, okay. So if certain fibers in the capsule play a distinct role, for example, they prevent rotation. So after some time, what we do is we actually recognize that oh. The, the fibers in this area of the capsule actually play an active role in resisting a certain kind of movement. So we give them the name anterior lateral ligament, for example. So that's why we call it a new ligament. They, they always existed. We did not suddenly evolve a new ligament, no. It's just that we just recognize the, the function of those fibers and we call it a new ligament. Like, so that's, that's okay. what I'm doing. <laughs> All right. If not, I would think okay, that now, I would Okay, go on. Yes, okay. <laughs> So this is, this is something that I found quite interesting. Now, nowadays what we do is we just, when, when we suspect any uh, you know, ligament injury, we just throw the patient into the MRI scanner and it comes out with a diagnosis. Of course, the radiologist helps. But so this is the original, the first MRI machine that was done. In fact, that guy sitting there in the middle is, is the inventor of the MRI machine. So when he tried to, he was the first test, test subject and apparently what happened is he was too fat to fit into the coils of the MRI. So the first MRI uh, scan was a, was a failure because of that. So finally he got someone thinner to, to sit inside the coils and it was a success. You mean and, they had uh, to wear the coil? 
yeah, last time what when they developed it, actually the coil was around the patient. Oh. But nowadays, as you can yes. see on the on the cartoon there, yeah. you know things are so easy. You just put them into the machine. Okay, that's just a little bit of um, history, just for for you know for your knowledge. But it doesn't really affect our our presentation today. But despite the fact that we've got MRI scanners, I think it's really important to be able to pick up some clinical uh, findings because you know not not all of us have an MRI scanner sitting in the room. And uh, these are some examples. So, for example, we talked about the MPFL ligament. So you can see what happens when you have an MPFL injury. Essentially, is you dislocate your patella. So I hope I can play this video. So do you see that uh, popping, popping of the of the knee? Did you see that? Can you show Let it? Let me play it again. Yeah, oh. I'll show it again. All right. Keep your eye on the patella. You see that. As oh, the patient yes. moves their leg into a straight position, the patella moves abnormally outward. So we call it an inverted J. All right. So I just I'm just going to show you a few uh, interesting looking clinical signs. So for the the MCL and the LCL, which are these two ligaments on the side, mm -hmm. we have this virus and bowel stress test, which you can see on this video. So all we are doing basically is just putting a bit of extra stress. On the on the on the knee, so you you'll see that it moves very abnormally yes. inwards. So that is a sign of of laxity of the of the ligament or an injury this of the ligament. Very important. Having found this, yeah, this is hmm? very important for medical students and also even uh, postgraduate students. Yeah, I think yes, and I think it's it's not just for for students, but rather in our daily practice. You know, we if we want to do an MRI for everyone, it, it, it's going to be, well, it's not going to be easy. Lah. So I think it's important to pick up some of these things. If you've got a PCL injury, which is the one at the back, what happens is the tibia falls backwards. So if you make the patient lie down, you can actually see that sagging take place like this. But anyway, let's go to, to you know, higher tech things at the moment. So the question now is, we know that x-rays can most of the time, uh, well, as orthopedic surgeons, we always say that x-rays see bone, MRI see soft tissue. So do we really need to do an x-ray in a ligament injury because the ligament is a soft tissue? Uh, chances are we won't see much on the x-ray. Uh, there are some cases where you actually will see some things on the x-ray. For example, as you can see in this picture, you've got an avulsion fracture of the ACL ligament. That can be seen on the x-ray. You can see that it's a little piece at the center which has popped out. Do you see that one there? Where? The deepest point of culture? Yes. Yeah, yeah, they pointed there with the arrow. Yes, that's yes, right. my, my... <laughs> You can't see okay. it. <laughs> yeah, I can't see it because you are blocked. Okay. Uh, then you can have things like loose bodies in the knee. So, what this is, is when a piece of bone or a piece of cartilage gets pulled off somehow from, from the inside of the knee and it floats around inside. So we can see that sometimes on the x-ray, as you can see there. Uh, the other thing is, and this is something which really is quite typical, is we call it a Seagon fracture. You can see that there's a little chip of bone there, which has come off from the outer side of the knee. Now this is actually uh, almost 100% equal to the patient having an ACL tear. So when a patient has an ACL tear, what happens is, the ligament in the center of the knee is torn. As a result, most of the stress goes on to the outer side of the knee and as it rotates, it pulls off a little piece of bone. So when you see this, oh my God. Even, without, even without the MRI, you know that there, there has been an ACL ligament tear there. Okay, now we talked about the MRI. So I, I think what I want to do is just show you two of the main things that we want to see on a knee MRI most of the time. So we talk about, I mean, especially in, in, in sporting circles, if you talk about football players, badminton players, most of them are aware of things like ACL injuries. So what is the ACL? You can see that there's a ligament here. You can see it's, it's highlighted in yellow. On the left, all it is is the same picture without the highlight. So I'll show you what it looks like when the ACL has been injured. So you can see that that, that line, that black line has totally disappeared. So there's no ACL left on this MRI. Oh, because it's okay. torn? It's torn, yes. 
It's fun. Oh, so obvious, huh? Yeah. Now and there's no ACL. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Betty, I think orthopedics is mainly like playing like, oh, you don't really, things are quite clear. You can just see that one line or no line. Yeah, most of the time, la. It's so uh, it's quite obvious, but you need to show us, la, for for me to realize. Yeah. It's unlike unlike looking at the ECG and you know you've got like twelve <laughs> different leads and so okay. okay. So the the next thing is what about meniscus tear? So this is a normal meniscus. You see, there's there's two little triangles there on the black triangles, on the it's actually the front and the back. So. If you've got a nice black triangle like this, then you know that it's pretty much a normal meniscus. However, when you see an abnormal meniscus, you'll see a little white line going within the, the, the triangle. So this is just what a meniscus tear looks like. Just for your information, we won't dwell on this. So let's zoom into the ACL uh, ligament test because I think that's the most common thing that people are worried about, especially uh, Patients are actually especially worried about this. So I'm just going to go through a few uh, things like what do patients need to know? So if you are seeing patients, I think this is really important. And then we'll talk about what doctors need to know. So we're just going to go through a few points and then I think we are almost done. So when we talk about what patients need to know, these are some common things. Not all ligament tests and especially ACL tests are painful. Now we get the idea that when you tear a ligament, it must be very painful. Right, but it's not necessarily so. Usually, within the first day when you first get the injury, it tends to be painful. The knee gets swollen up, but within no time, within a few days, the swelling subsides. The patient may even forget that they had this injury, and uh, later on, they come and say that, "Hey, uh, doc, when I when I run, I, I feel that my knee is not stable. It keeps moving. I, I feel like I'm going to fall. I don't have confidence." So when you ask them. Is it painful? They will say, uh, no, there's no pain. So actually, uh, ligament injuries can present with instability without pain. Not all tears are painful. Second thing is, not all tears equal surgery. If you've got a partial tear of the ligament, if you've got a tear of one of the, the outer ligaments, the MCL and the LCL, these usually don't require surgery. Surgery is actually reserved for patients who really have uh, instability, Despite having adequate physiotherapy and rehab and muscle strengthening, that's when we go for surgery most of the time. The next thing is without proper treatment, most maybe I should add most complete ACL tears lead to early osteoarthritis. So I just put up an X-ray there to show what the normal knee looks like on the left and what the knee with osteoarthritis looks like on the X-ray. Um, if you have got a tear of the ligament the ACL ligament inside the knee, what happens is with every movement, you've got extra rotation forces going on the meniscus, on the cartilage. So it's not a surprise that you develop osteoarthritis. This is something that the patients have to know, and they also have to take steps to avoid this, which is to strengthen the muscles around the knee to get a, a good support structure around the knee. They can wear things like knee support, knee braces, but it doesn't beat building up your own muscle and, and having a, a layer inside that is protecting your knee. Let's see, you have a question? Yeah, is it over time? Uh, how long will it take to for this uh, osteoarthritis to develop? Good, good question. I mean, if you've got a severe meniscus tear, mm -hmm. where you've lost part of the meniscus, it can be as fast as five to 10 years after the injury. However, if you're talking about just an ACL ligament, I don't think there's a, a definite timeline, you know, is it going to happen in 10 years, 20 years? It depends on the patient's age, depends on how their muscle structure is, whether they've got a good muscle envelope. However, generally, if this patient was to develop osteoarthritis at the age of 60, let's say, so probably you would bring forward that by about 10 to 15 years. So by the age of 45 or so, they, they probably would start having signs of osteoarthritis in the injured knee. So it will bring it forward. I see. Okay. Okay. The next thing that patients need to know is that pre if they are going for surgery, prior to going for surgery, they do have to go for rehabilitation. The aims here are to, number one, strengthen the muscle. Number two is to get a proper bending. Because initially when you have a, a ligament tear, what happens is there's a lot of bleeding inside the joint. It will be difficult for the patient to fully straighten the knee. It will be difficult for the patient to bend the knee properly. 
if they go into surgery without addressing these issues, then the, the post-surgery recovery becomes much slower. So it's really important to send them for physiotherapy before surgery to get knee bending and knee straightening and also muscle strengthening. And uh, post-surgery knee rehab, we'll talk about it later. Now, no, I'm just, worried, surgery, uh, I'm just worried that sometimes when you send the patient for physio, especially mm -hmm. and the strengthen and the pain is less, then they don't want surgery. Mm -hmm. Like my patient, actually I don't know many, mm -hmm. I don't know orthopedic that well, but recently I had mm -hmm. one patient who had a meniscus tear and then he was mm -hmm. advised for surgery, he refused. And now he always get the locked knee, you know, that's why I ask you how long it takes. So I, I asked oh. him for stress test, he came with a chest pain, but I said, okay, we mm -hmm. do a simple test for you, we do the stress test. He said, why if my knee get locked? I said, why? Because I had the meniscus, meniscus tear and I didn't want to do the surgery. So he's not old, you know, he's about 50 something, 60 years old. It's, uh, you know, I think, I think, I think it's, it's him. okay. Actually, I think the communication with the patient is really huh. important because right. sometimes you have to tell them, look, you, you, it depends on the lifestyle. If, if the patient is really active and they want to go back to football, for example, badminton, usually they are quite motivated. They will be the one who come and chase you for surgery. I prefer it that way. I prefer that the patient comes and tells me they want surgery rather than I tell them that they need to undergo surgery because they actually put a lot more effort in, in getting better if they are the ones who make the decision. But it's, of course, it's our part. Our role is to yes. inform them that, look, if you don't have surgery, this is going to happen. You're going to get arthritis. You're not going to be able to play sports and things like that. And I think that that's when they understand that, you know, even though I have a, a, a better knee function now, because I have an ultimate goal that I want to go back to climbing mountains, for example, and they'll say that I'm going to go for surgery even though I feel better because I, I understand the, what that, what's at stake. Yeah. That's right. I was so shocked that he didn't want surgery despite that his mm -hmm. knees get locked now and again. But how? But is his chest pain something to worry about? Would it be risky for surgery for him? Or... Yeah, yeah. When he comes out, I, I no, the chest pain I, is, doesn't sound uh -huh. typical of angina. So okay. I'm not too worried. Yeah. I will ask you right. later. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. The next thing is surgery is only one step on the road to, to recovery because after surgery, it takes about 10 to 12 months for these patients to go back to, to active sports, to go back to the similar level that they were before surgery. So that's something that patients really need to understand. They need to be committed to rehabilitation for about at least about 10 months after the surgery. If they are not able to commit, I would recommend that probably don't go for the surgery. Just try to adjust your lifestyle, not to participate in two active sports. That that would be we are talking about ACL injuries here, lah. Meniscus injuries is a totally different thing because meniscus injuries usually they are painful, so the patients don't don't really. It, it would be better if they get surgery to repair it. But ACL ligament injuries usually they don't have pain, so if they are willing to bring down their expectations for sports, then they can get away without, without surgery most of the time. Okay, so now we talk about, just now we talk about what patients need to know, now we talk about what doctors need to know. And by this, I mean general practitioners. Anyway, and, and I didn't realize that even a cardiologist would be seeing patients with meniscus injuries. Like, <laughs> so yeah, I, I didn't know that. I, I thought you'd be looking at the heart and listening well, I, to the lungs, I mean, I mean I... The, the heart and things like that. Usually I would like ask, uh, no, he, he volunteered, he volunteered, mm -hmm. so why don't I, I send you for the stress test and he said, do you think I can walk? I said, why? You look fine to me, it's only 50 something. He said, because I had a minute mm -hmm. there and then sometimes my knee locked when I had to have to run. So, you know, so locking, I, locking is actually kind of an emergency, you know, because we, yeah, we kind of have to. Many times. Hmm. So it's been two okay. years. Yeah, two years already. Maybe he's learned to cope with it. Lah. Possible. So anyway, maybe you should talk to him about getting yeah. it sorted out. Yeah. At least get an MRI or something. Lah. Yeah. Okay, so what do doctors need to know? They need to know when to suspect such injuries. So they need to know how such injuries happen. 
and typically there are, there are certain movements, certain kind of uh, you know uh, sporting accidents that cause ACL injuries. So again, we are talking about ACL injuries. So these are in contact sports. For example, you're playing football, your opponent comes and kicks into your knee. This is a direct injury to the ACL. Some non-contact mechanisms as well. I just put this here if you want to have a look at it later. But let's look essentially how can we summarize this. So if you look at this picture, you see that this patient's foot is on the floor. And you see there's, there are two, two arrows there, the blue arrow and the green arrow. So it shows the rotation in different directions. Actually, that's what causes problems with the ACL, that rotation of the knee. So if you're running and you suddenly stop, what happens is the lower part of your leg stops, but the upper part, because your momentum is still there, it, it rotates. So that can cause a tear if you suddenly stop very fast when you run. The second thing is if you are running and then you suddenly decide to change directions. So that's a sudden, sudden rotational injury on your knee. So that, these are some of the things that can cause. As a, as a doctor, I think it's, it's important when the patient tells you injury, you've got to ask them, you know, how did this happen? Just describe to me how it happened because that's really important for you to know whether it's just a minor injury or it could involve a, a ligament tear. The next thing we talk about risk factors. Doctors need to know that, first of all, contact sports are high risk factor, things like football, like rugby, basketball, uh, badminton. Okay, the next thing is maybe a little bit controversial, but female athletes tend to get ligament injuries much, much more than male athletes. Maybe partly because of... Sorry, we lost you there. Hormonal differences. That oh, mean, sorry. Can males naturally have larger muscles. Oh, Hello? you mean? Oh, yeah. Sorry, my my line is not stable. Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Hear you. Can you hear me? All right. Okay. So sorry, my line is not stable. So I female, hear you. Yes. female tend to have more more knee injuries. Mm -hmm. Oh. More ligament injury. More, more ligament, ligament injury. Injuries. Yeah, more ligament injuries. Is it possible that you get more right. injury, uh, ligament problem when you're post-pregnant? Um, well, post-pregnant, I don't see ladies who have, you know, recently delivered going and playing football most of the time. Yeah. So maybe of if course. they did, you might see it more. But in my practice, usually it is uh, younger ladies. Some of the some of the reasons that have been postulated are hormonal changes. Definitely, there are there are some uh, some papers that. Ayo, how come I what is that? You know, whether we can, well, you, can you hear me? Yeah, it's a bit uh, a bit Copy, it? yeah laggy. I think it's my, what, okay. So, women, okay, women, huh? funny, huh? Yeah, okay, I think this this topic is a very, very deep topic uh -huh. about, uh, you know, injuries in female athletes because there's lots of factors involved, muscle bulk, hormones, uh, the, the, the fact that women participate in certain sports that are different from men. So, I don't think we can cover all of this, but okay. yes, Definitely, women do, they are at a higher risk group. So they have to warm up more. They have to train in special ways. They have to have a proper trainer to, to participate in all these sports. Okay, the next thing is how does the patient. How come so bad? Huh? How come so bad? Yeah. Hold on, huh? From my end, everything is okay, actually. Okay. I think it's me, right. huh? Okay. Go on. All right. All right. So, uh, the patient has a sudden sound with a very loud pop. And Hold on. Huh? Hold on. Can, is, from your end, it's okay, is it? Dr. Putra, your line is like quite breaking out here. Yeah, your line is breaking up.
Putra, can you? Okay. You okay? Can we try again? Which one? Today we have been having this technical okay. problem. Yeah. Now good. Can you hear me now? Oh, no, it's All not. Right. Okay. You use your hotspot. Yeah, I just restarted my... Yeah, I, I, I use my hotspot now. Yeah. Because you're... it's better than the hospital line. That's right. It's so much better. You're... Oh, you. I wish we could start the talk all over again. Okay, play play your slide again, please. Okay. Oh, no, all right. it's much better. Uh, slide show. One moment. Oh, so much better. Okay, okay. so let me just... Let me just tell you again what the typical presentation is. The patient is playing a sport like, let's call it football. He was running, someone knocked into his knee. He had a sudden uh, shooting pain with a popping sound and he was not able to continue playing the game. So this is a typical presentation in an ACL test. Not being able to continue playing the game, the popping sound and a uh, rapidly increasing swelling of the knee. So that's what the doctors need to know, like, to be aware that that's the mm -hmm. cause of it. So what do you do when, when, let's say you are a general practitioner and a patient comes in with a knee swelling, you're not sure whether there's a ligament tear, you don't go and do an MRI straight away. What you will do is you will initially put the patient on some form of immobilizer. It doesn't have to be something like this. It can be just a very thick padded bandage around the knee. You give them some uh, NSAIDs, something to manage the pain, let them rest, tell them not to put weight on this foot as much as possible. And in one or two days, you reassess the knee. If the swelling has gone down and they don't have any issues, it's all right. If they are still having swelling, they're still having pain, it would be best to at least have an x-ray done or arrange a, a, a consult with an orthopedic surgeon just to have a look just to, so that they can assess the knee. But well, a tear in the... the yeah. Can you hear me? It it can it can heal by itself. Yeah, I can. Okay. Okay. Now remember we talked about now at this moment we are talking about ACL tests. ACL tests do not heal on their own. Oh, okay? won't heal. But on if they are tests of the other ligament, yeah, ACL tests don't heal on their own. Well, that that is a, a common question. In fact, when we look at uh, you know there's a question that that doctors need to know: Can a torn ACL heal? The answer is no. Why? Because the ligaments on the outer side of the knee, they have a good blood supply from the outside, so they will heal. But the ACL is basically floating in the center of the knee. It doesn't have a proper blood supply, number one. Number two, because when, when it is torn, it is floating around, you don't really get good contact, so it doesn't heal. And the third thing is because what happens is it becomes cut and then it does not heal. So the conclusion is no, it does not heal. It does require reconstruction if it is significant. Okay. Uh, we talked about MRI. I don't think I'm going to go into now. So we are almost at the end of the, the, the my slides, but I just want to ask, what do orthopedic surgeons need to know? And uh, we don't have to go in details about this. The, the thing is, what we need to know is Timing of surgery, usually we do it within two weeks to two months after the injury. That's the best time. It gets the best result. The second thing is that we don't repair the ACL when it's torn. What we do is we recreate an ACL. We reconstruct the ACL. So we have to use a graft. Or, I see. Uh, we have to replace the natural. Yeah, we don't repair it. Oh. So how it's done is we either take the patient's own tendons as a graft, or we can. <laughs> okay, we're losing you. Is it you or is it me now? And usually it's, it's me, lah. Okay, go on. All right. Okay, so we have we have natural grafts from the patient themselves. We have synthetic grafts. 
And we've got something which we call an allograph, which is essentially from a cadaveric donor. So these are the options for graph. Okay. Then what we do is we hey, drill tunnels why we can't into repair? the bone. Why is it we can't repair? Because it doesn't because it ne it never the ACL is under so much of stress that yeah. if you just repair it, it will not achieve uh, healing because it, it doesn't have a good blood supply. I see. Okay. So it will not. It, it's just like the way when you have a hip fracture in an older patient, it doesn't heal, so you have to replace the hip. You know. So it's it's a similar concept in in that sense. Oh, I never asked that. So question. this is how. Okay. Which question? You mean about the, the hip fracture? Oh, no. Yes, that's right. Why we have to replace the hip? Yeah, okay. Remember, you're talking about the 90-year-old gentleman. That's right, that's right. So I mean, of course, I know what, every what time was, yeah, hip. we replace the hip. Replacement. Yes. Right. I never asked But you don't see us doing hip replacements in... It's, it's usually in patients who are above the age of 50 or 60, lah. Because if it's in a young patient, 30s, 20s, we would fix, even a hip fracture, we would fix it. Because the chance to heal is good, there's a good blood supply, but the blood supply gets progressively worse as, as time goes by, as, as the okay. person ages. All right, so this is another thing that now is, is quite, uh, different surgeons do things differently. They have uh, this kind of, of metal buttons that we use. There are certain screws that we use. We won't go into details. I just want you to know that there are several options when it comes to choosing how to fix the new ACL. Okay. And actually what I wanted to say is that, you know, uh, treating a patient with instability, treating a patient with ACL injuries, actually we do have to work as, as a team. Uh, I did mention about physiotherapists. We also have things like rehabilitation physicians, like sports physicians, all of us have to work together. I think that's really the important message that I wanted to give was that we have to work as a team to make these patients go from having an unstable knee to having a stable knee. And I think it's important in life also that we have to work as a team. And this is uh, just to show you some of the members in my team, just to, to, do a, to do a surgery to repair or to reconstruct an ACL, it's not just a one-man job. So you have a big team, somebody has to prepare the graph, somebody has to drill the hole, somebody has to put the, the, the graph through. So there's a lot of work involved. You can't do it alone. And with that, I come to the end of my slides. This just shows we went for a holiday recently and uh, you know we have to work as a team because ultimately as one person, you are just so small. So you need a big team to make a difference in the world. So that's what I would like to share with you guys. He just wants to show his beautiful wife. La. <laughs> okay, we have uh, some. Well, it's a good excuse to show her. <laughs> we we have some question from Doctor Doctor Johan asks, in the context of knee instability, which advancement on innovative technique has emerged in orthopedic, and how are they influencing treatment approaches? Well, it sounds like a very wow. um, big. Let me see. Yeah. Uh... Yes. Is, so, is the question there in the is in the chat? In the oh there, yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yes. In the context advancement. Okay. Well, I would say that what is new when it comes to replacing the knee, the, the new in thing is robotic surgery. Now we don't have that for ligament replacement, I mean ligament reconstruction. But what we have moved towards is well, when it comes to, to doing ligament reconstruction, what we do is we try to get earlier return to sport. We try to get lower rates of, of uh, re-rupture because when you talk about sports, uh, sportsmen and sportswomen, they are in a high impact uh, field, you know, I mean, they're they are, they are doing high level sports. So the tendency to get re-injured is high. So we've got things like synthetic ligaments. We have got things like reducing uh, the, the, the incision sizes by using things like an all inside technique. Previously, we used to have to drill large tunnels, so we try to reduce the size of those tunnels, reduce the need for putting screws in there, and the rehabilitation protocol also has been changing over the years. So these are some of the things that have evolved. I think that the most, what makes a real difference is educating the patient and letting them know that, you know, rehabilitation is 
one of the most important things, even I would say more important than the surgery itself. And also uh, to work in a team together with rehabilitation physicians, together with sports physicians and physiotherapists. I think that's, that's what I would say to this question. I think uh, Dr. Susie asked, can you elaborate on non-surgical treatment? I think she, she asked you this before you actually continued your talk and during your talk, uh, you did mention quite a lot of non-surgical treatment options. And, um, okay. Yeah, and you also said what will determine the surgical intervention, especially in ligament tear, right? All right, yes, correct. I think, I mean, just maybe to recap, yeah. what we would do is we would try non-surgical first. We would send the patient for things like quadricep strengthening, hamstring strengthening, uh, electrical stimulation of the, of the quadriceps muscle, especially the, the VMO or the vastus medialis obliquus part of the quadriceps. We would send the patient for proprioceptive retraining, which is training the receptors inside the knee to, to be able to sense the position of the knee. So this is all part of the, the conservative management. Uh, when it comes to deciding for surgery, I think it comes down a lot to number one, what is the patient's expectation in terms of return to sport? Are they planning to return to you know, elite level sports in that case? I don't think there's a way to escape surgery. The second thing is, uh, is the patient having any other injuries? For example, if they've got a meniscus injury and a ligament injury, and you're going to go in to repair the meniscus injury, it makes sense that at the same time, you just reconstruct the ACL instead of just doing one half job, and then the patient may need to go for surgery later. Okay, okay. we have a question a from question Facebook. Three. Sorry, can we take a question from Facebook? Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is a sure. patient. He said, doctor, I had slip and fell in 2019 and then my left knee twisted and cracked. A sound was heard. Mm -hmm. And an MRI shows knee have to have mild OA, thickening, mm -hmm. ab thickening and abnormal high signal at the femoral attachment of medial collateral ligaments. Okay. Like it to be torn. Bone marrow contusion in the lateral femoral condyle. Been attended few times of physio. However, today my knee still have pain on and off. Okay, at this point of time, I want to say one thing. These days we see a lot of physios opening up. Okay, and sometimes they do not actually see a doctor and get a consultation, and they go straight to a physio. I'm not sure whether this happened or not because he said he went for physio. He, but he did an MRI, so he must have seen a doctor. Mm -hmm. But he's asking what would you advise? Now it's 2019 and there's four years. Okay. Now from his MRI, the, the, remember he said that he's got thickening at the femoral attachment of the medial collateral ligament, correct? Yes. yes. That, as I was telling you, is the ligament on the outer side here it will heal on its own. In probably 80 to 90% of cases, it will heal on its own. So that in four years time should have had some healing. Yes. Then he said about the, the bone contusions at the lateral femoral condyle, mm -hmm. that also in most cases would have healed. So what is left is the OA or the osteoarthritis changes that were there on the MRI as well, right? Oh, probably I... those are what, what are still causing the pain. Uh, pain in the knee. So probably we'll have, to, I mean, I'm not sure what his age, his or her age is, but I think it would be a good idea to have a new x-ray done at least. Have a look, compare what is the osteoarthritis like in 2019 versus now. Then of course, we, we will probably uh, approach this less like a, a laxity case and more like an osteoarthritis or, or meniscus injury case. So again, we are looking at Possibly putting a scope inside the knee and cleaning up the knee, doing what we call a, a debridement, maybe a little bit of uh, hyaluronic acid injection into the knee. These are, are options, but of course it's hard to determine exactly what without yes. assessing, but that's, that's probably how I would go for this yes. case. Okay, so basically his injury seems to would have healed, but the underlying mm -hmm. OA is the problem, yeah? 
So we I have think... another question. Say, Dr. Nuru Atika asks, Dr. Putra, mm -hmm. how effective is removal of bone spur in a young patient with early OA? Does it really work? She is very active in she's active in sports. I think it depends because now if you're talking about bone spur with early osteoarthritis, we are not talking about uh, full-blown arthritis where the patient needs a knee replacement and that kind of thing. We're probably talking about cartilage injuries, especially because she's young, she's active in sports, and there's just minor so-called bone spurs, which I would probably say equals to cartilage injuries. I think what we could think about is probably doing an MRI, having a look at her cartilage. If there are issues with the cartilage that require, remember I showed you the picture where there was a, a hole in the cartilage and then it was drilled and then we put yes. a collagen matrix in there. So that probably would be what we are going for in this particular patient. Because uh, I mean, I'm not sure how old she is. If she's you know in her 20s, 30s, then I wouldn't, we wouldn't approach it as removing the bone spur rather addressing the, the, the damage to the cartilage that has occurred. The spur is a sign of damage to the cartilage. That's, that's what the spur is. It's not the problem in itself. It's a sign of the cartilage damage. Okay, Dr. Chu asks, does acupuncture help? Okay, excellent question. You sure? You know, uh, if you ask me this like some years ago, I would probably roll my eyes and, and not yeah, say I'm rolling like my that. eyes. <laughs> yeah. But I have I have realized that uh, there is a limit to what we can provide in, you know, from a Western medical me medicine point of view. Acupuncture actually has its role in pain relief. In fact, I'm not sure about you, but I had uh, several TCM students come and, and attach with me here in Beacon. And uh, so they were telling me about acupuncture and, and I did, send a few of my patients for acupuncture because the patients were very interested in it and I wanted to see how it would, it would improve things. Some of the patients actually have a good pain relief. Now, I cannot explain how acupuncture results in pain relief. Maybe there could be a placebo effect in there, I'm not sure, but I think there's no harm with it. What I would say is that if you've got a swelling on the knee and you know there's like a hematrosis bleeding within the knee, at that point of time, I wouldn't recommend acupuncture because it's going to increase the risk of infection. But otherwise, if it's been a long time since the injury and you have tried many other things, I think there's no harm going for acupuncture. Okay, I myself have one last question. Okay, now mm -hmm. I do a lot of climbing and um, actually I want to retire becoming a mountain near mountaineer okay mm -hmm. um, wait you want to retire from being a cardiologist and become a mountaineer that's what you meant right okay yes okay okay so what now i find a lot of people who are climbing not so much me not at all but when the problem is when you come down it really takes an mm -hmm. impact on the knee how do we protect mm -hmm. the knee i want to learn so Excellent that I can... okay let's have a look at this model here okay, okay. This model has been quite useful today. Yeah, that's now, right. I love you it. That, you see that there's a, the kneecap or the patella here. You've uh -huh. got the, the femur here. So when you climb down, essentially your knee is in this position. Correct? Okay. You go, when you climb down, your knee will be partly bent and then you will straighten it and you will bend and straighten it. It's the same when you climb downstairs. So what happens is there's a lot of friction between these, these two surfaces here. So what you want to try and do is you want to try and increase the space between these two articular surfaces or joint surfaces. If you have a large quadricep, a strong quadricep muscle, it will naturally pull, not so dramatically as this line, okay. but it will naturally yeah, pull the patella slightly away from, from the femur. So that results in less friction between the patella and the femur. So mostly the issue is quadricep weakness, which is why the, the if you if you forget everything, I think it's, when a patient comes and sees you with knee pain, with knee instability, if you just send them for quadricep strengthening, I think that's the best thing you can do for them because that would, be, that would solve at least some of their issues. So coming down stairs or coming down a slope, increasing the quadricep strength would improve the space between the patella and the femur, result in less friction and less pain. So that's in, in a simple way how I would 
answer that okay, question. So you need to do exercises that will increase your the strength of your body strength, like yeah. cycling, for example. Oh, cycling. Oh. Mm. Swimming is good as well, but but I would probably go with cycling as a more mainstream way, lah. Easier for people to do because you just get a gym bike and just hop on it. Swimming, you gotta wash your hair, you gotta do oh, all sorts of things. I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know why I don't have problems, Tashwood, but a lot of people mm -hmm. find that they give up the climbing because mm -hmm. of coming down. They have pain, so they can't do it anymore. And uh, I don't want to reach that that stage. Okay, thank you very much. And then all the okay. doctors, you have already shared the CPD registration form and the nurses can register. I'm going to stop sharing, uh, stop registration soon. And we have a very, yeah, good attendance today, both sides, three sides on Docuity. Okay, very happy to, to, yeah. to meet all you guys today. Okay, maybe next year. See you then. Happy right. New Year. Merry okay. Christmas. Send bye bye. Merry Christmas bye -bye. and Happy New Year. Bye bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you, bye. guys. Bye, everyone. See you next week.